Uh, this is the fourth day of the Ayuka Summer School uh, refresher course. Um, we are glad that you are still here and uh, a number of you are attending. And we hope that you are finding the lectures useful. Uh, I'm Surud More. I will act as the moderator for uh, this particular lecture. Um, so uh, today we have three lectures. Um, uh, Shomak will give at, uh, from 10 to 11, then there's 11.30 to 12.30, and then 2.15 to 3.15 as well. So uh, please join us then as well. Um, I guess we can start the streaming now, right? Is that right, Shomak? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so Shomak, please take. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Yuri. So um, um, thank you again for everybody who's um, um, online for, um, for uh, staying with us till now. And I hope you will stay with us till the end of the month. This goes on for a whole month. Um, and I, um, this is the last one of my block of four lectures uh, to start this off. And I will come back again uh, later on um, for other things. Uh, the schedule is on your... Uh, um, the link has been sent to you. Look at uh, the various lectures that are on there. So um, today, uh, what I will round off uh, is my, the discussion I started after discussing the, um, the basics of uh, astronomical measurement, uh, the units that we use, the various uh, ways uh, um, we characterize the size of the universe, and, and uh, as a result, um, the age of the universe, is, um, uh, is to... Um, look at how uh, we um, um, measure distances outside our immediate neighborhood. So I did say, for example, that um, we use things which we call uh, standard candles, um, which means uh, that uh, we uh, know how big, bright they are or big they are, and then we look at um, how, um, how they appear to us, and as a result, um, and, uh, measure their distances. And this theme will stay with us through today's lecture. But just to recap um, what we uh, did, um, I, I just said that the whole thing depends on a ladder. And this ladder, um, just in any ladder, the bottom rung is very important. Because if it's not strong enough, then uh, um, the rungs above it become far more weak. And here it is, the bottom rung is the distances we measure right at the Earth and near the Earth, within our solar system. And these things, then whatever errors we make there, propagate uh, through this system. And, and, uh, and so it's very, uh, very useful for us or very important for us to actually make, that, um, uh, make those measurements very importantly, uh, very, very um, um, uh, accurately. And, and so um, I said that one of the basic things we do is measure the distance of the moon by shining a laser and reflecting them off these uh, arrays that various astronauts and moon missions have left on the surface of the moon. We talked about this. We talked about how then we define the AU, uh, the distance uh, between the Earth and Venus by um, um, reflecting off uh, a radar um, of uh, Venus and then measuring the distance accurately. And then we talked about how we go from that to um, nearby stars by uh, knowing the distance between uh, the sun and the earth and using that as a baseline to measure the parallax of, um, uh, of nearby stars and how uh, the nearby stars are displaced as the earth goes around the, the sun. Uh, we also talked about how, um, for example, uh, the latest uh, parallax mission from space, uh, which uh, of course is not affected by the blurring of the atmosphere and so can measure distances very, very accurately, has been up on a mission um, at the second Lagrangian point between the Earth and the Sun uh, to um, uh, look at um, the uh, about measuring distances and proper motions and other uh, parameters, their radial motions, their uh, other properties um, with a camera and a spectrograph. Um, has been doing this for the last uh, seven years uh, and uh, the data uh, are coming out um, of uh, for about a billion stars in our galaxy. That's uh, almost um, about a percent of the number of stars that there are in our galaxy. So it's a three-dimensional model and also measures distances very, very accurately. So that's the, the, the bottom rung of the data. And uh, that's where I, I finished yesterday. 
and I um, said that what we'll do is essentially what we uh, use these standard candle methods now. To do that, what you do is you take that, you know that light falls off as, um, um, as, as one over r squared. And so you take something that you know the actual luminosity of, uh, but some physics or some astronomy should, um, should motivate that. So you should know how much, because nobody hands you a light bulb and says, this is a 100 watt bulb that's well calibrated. Uh, in, in, in the uh, sky, there are things for which we have to know how, how bright they are out of some astrophysics. And then what you do is you measure the flux of the uh, radiation that comes from that. And you can measure that very accurately. And then since you know the luminosity, which is the actual power output from the, uh, from the object, you can measure the distance. And that's why it's called the standard candle. So I'm, I'm going to, for example, give an example of, um, um, of uh, a plot that I showed yesterday. Uh, yesterday, in the, um, uh, we, you had a discussion uh, which started for of stellar physics. And, and you know that um, uh, um, most stars, like our sun, for example, uh, in its equilibrium phase, where it is burning hydrogen into helium and, um, and, and going through the basic um, uh, uh, nucleosynthesis, uh, basic uh, fusion uh, reaction that gives out the, the energy from a star in its core. It lies on a very nice uh, tight sequence called main sequence in this diagram, which is, um, which is luminosity uh, versus uh, what is known as spectral type, which is essentially related to its temperature, surface temperature. Uh, you know that a star can be treated as a black body and the black body means that uh, its spectral energy distribution um, has uh, follows what is known as Planck's law. And um, then uh, this Planck's law is, is one single parameter and that is its temperature. And so um, the spectral distribution of a star, even if you measure uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, flux and uh, in, in, in uh, various parts of the spectrum by taking a couple of filters, um, a set of filters and measure it at various uh, different um, uh, frequencies or wavelengths, then you can actually measure um, its, its spectrum and uh, that tells you the temperature. And that can be very accurately measured. Um, as you know, our sun's surface temperature is 5,800 degrees Kelvin. And, and, and so um, that makes it a G star and, and it's right in the middle somewhere here. And once you know, because if you know that, that, that a star is a main sequence star, and there are ways of telling whether it's a main sequence star or it's out of this sequence, it's somewhere else on this diagram, so-called hertzsprung russell diagram, um, uh, then uh, it, it, this, this kind of argument won't work. If it's a giant, for example, like Betelgeuse or whatever these things, but it has to be a main sequence star, then you can read off its luminosity. And this makes it a standard candle. Right. So a standard candle is something that you, you can measure its luminosity. You can't measure its luminosity directly. That's how, how, much, um, how much energy it gives out. But you have some other measure that helps you predict its luminosity. Right. And I told you once you know its luminosity, then by measuring its flux, its apparent luminosity from the Earth, which you can do from photometers and CCD cameras and stuff like that, you can measure its distance. So that's... Uh, one of the basic ways um, uh, people started doing this in the middle of the 20th century when, um, when uh, people realized uh, and mostly realized out of the early work of uh, Mignat Saha and, uh, and, uh, and Cecilia Payne that uh, there is this sequence of, uh, of stars that, is, uh, that, um, that can be related to its temperature. And once that is, uh, was, was found, uh, one of the people who was involved in this was Henry Norris Russell and the husband Russell diagram uh, you know, came into being. And, and, and uh, this, um, this kind of argument helped us understand what these distances to these stars are. Now, these are not very accurate distances. It's, um, um, uh, uh, but as you can see, this uh, main sequence is pretty, pretty tight. So, but the error may be large, partly because of um, um, the um, measuring of uh, the luminosities. Um, uh, often the fluxes themselves can be affected by the intervening dust and, uh, and things like that. Also, um, 
the exact position on this uh, on this main sequence might not be very well measured. Uh, also, uh, you uh, you actually have to figure out whether it's on the main sequence or not. But it gives you um, um, a pretty good distance uh, to the nearest stars. Now, um, Hipparchos, when it went up, Hipparchos is a precursor of uh, of Gaia. Uh, I, I told you the, uh, about it yesterday. Um, Hipparchos measured uh, a lot of these, uh, um, about 100,000, uh, slightly more than 100,000 stars, the distances, and it helped us calibrate this main sequence, right? So we know these distances from parallax. It's why I'm saying it's a ladder. First of all, the, the parallax measurement of nearby stars uh, depends on our knowing the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But once we know the parallax, then we take this uh, main sequence and we can, um, uh, we can know the actual distances. And so we know the, um, the actual um, uh, luminosities of many of these stars. And thus you calibrate this thing, right? Now, I told you that we can measure things, uh, th these distances only up to a point and maybe there's maybe a, up to a 10% accuracy um, uh, um, uh, error in these, um, uh, these measurements. And that is because you can see that in, in, the, in the plot that I showed you in, in this, it, it seemed that this is a very thin sequence. Once you actually have a measurement of, um, <clears throat> of the main sequence, you can see that it is not as thin as that. This is an experimental plot uh, in which all the Hipparchos stars have been put in there. And, and you can see once you measure the real distances, et cetera, um, then um, the, the actual main sequence is, is not as thin as it, as it appears. And that is why that, that introduces a kind of error in, uh, in our measurement based on that. And so this uh, as is essentially um, known as uh, um, spectroscopic parallax. That's the uh, word, that's the term that you use in the literature. So if you were looking up um, on, on Google, on, on, on this way of measuring distances, look up spectroscopic parallax. So here you are in this whole thing, what we've done is we've looked at the, the nearby solar system stuff, you've looked at parallax, and we've looked at the third part, which is the main sequence fitting, which is called the spectroscopic parallax. Now, this is where um, directly measuring this becomes a little difficult because we are looking at accuracies that are um, uh, you know, slipping out because we are, 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 are making less and less accurate measurements of distances. And so we need a very well measured um, uh, luminosities of, uh, of objects with which to calibrate these relations. So the next uh, step in this whole distance ladder uh, um, will be the Cepheid variables and uh, we look at the variable stars. So this comes from um, this remarkable woman um, uh, Henrietta Leavitt, who, um, um, who with this team of um, students and uh, basically a bunch of um, uh, women undergraduates uh, who were in Radcliffe College it, at Harvard University in the beginning of the, the 20th century at a time when women were not allowed to have university degrees in, in the best universities like Oxford, Cambridge and Harvard. Um, uh, there were women's colleges where uh, women could study and attend courses, but not get degrees or sit for exams. And even during that period, there were some remarkable uh, people in these institutions. And one such remarkable bunch of people, and it's worth reading about them. There are some lovely books in the, um, in, uh, out uh, talking about them. Um, and, um, uh, and a bunch of these people worked at the Harvard Observatory. Um, and uh, one of the early leaders um, under Edward Pickering's uh, leadership, uh, one of the early leaders was Henrietta Leavitt. And Henrietta Leavitt and her team of the so-called computers, these are a bunch of women who looked at um, photographs of stars taken with various telescopes, um, um, both in the Northern and in the Southern Hemisphere. Harvard had an observatory in South Africa, as well as several observatories in the US. Um, and uh, there were pictures taken of stars at various points, and they looked painstakingly at these stars and made some very important discoveries. One of the major discoveries that this group made was were the spectral classes of stars. I told you about um, the, the relation between the temperature of the star and the various uh, the spectrum 
uh, the spectral classes of the stars. I didn't go into much detail. Some other person will. And, um, and so this, this relation was discovered by these group of women under Henry to leave it and, and uh, several other people working at the, at the, um, in, in the same group. And this was later used by Cecilia Payne and Magnat Saha um, um, to actually put this whole story together of how the star's temperatures lead, is, is related to its, uh, uh, its, its, uh, its uh, spectroscopic properties and its evolution. Um, Henrietta Leavitt's group made another amazing uh, discovery, and that is they, they found that this, there's a special class of variable stars. There are many stars that vary in brightness. Some vary in brightness over hours. If you just in the same evening look at the same star repeatedly, you will find it's varying in brightness. Some of them have uh, periodicities of uh, a few hours. Some of them have periodicities of a few days. And the short period variables, some of these short period variables are called Cepheid variables. And as you can see, their brightness varies with time. And, um, and, and what Henrietta Leavitt uh, discovered was that um, the, period, the, 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 the period of this, uh, of this oscillation depends on the luminosity of the star. So what happens, and these are the Cepheid variables in this particular, um, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram I talked about, the diagram of luminosity versus temperature. Here is your main sequence that I showed you. And, uh, and the Cepheid variables lie somewhere here. This is where what happens is, and the stars, these stars have gone outside, is they, they've, um, they've finished their main sequence life and they are uh, on their way out of this equilibrium that exists uh, when um, uh, there is a, a nuclear fusion going on in the core of the star and, uh, and uh, that, uh, that fuel has ended. And now the star is going into a, some kind of an instability uh, before uh, some catastrophic things are going to happen to it. These things don't happen instantly. These things take tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years for the star to evolve out of the main sequence and become a giant and go supernova and things like that. So in, in, en route, there are these uh, phases in a star which are variable phases. And if you, can, if you, uh, if you see one of them, uh, then that, um, if it's a Cepheid variable and you can find it's a Cepheid variable looking at where it lies on this is diagram. Um, then you find that their light curves, their, their light varies with time uh, along um, in, 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 in shapes like these. And the brighter the star is, uh, it's related to um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the period. And, and so um, uh, you can find these Cepheid variables out to uh, now, out to about uh, a few uh, tens of megaparsecs. Um, our Lyries are also similar stars, which also have a, a relation between their, um, their luminosity and period. So what happens is, I'm just uh, um, trying to find one of these. So what happens is that once you find the period of a star, that tells you by the calibration that has been done by Leavitt and then following um, the 100 years of, uh, of uh, uh, observation, um, to figure out uh, the luminosity, the relation between the luminosity and the, uh, the period. And so once you know the period, the period is something that you can measure from the earth. It makes no, uh, um, uh, makes no assumption about the distance. Uh, and so it's a distance in, independent uh, quantity that you can measure. So you can see, you can measure the period. You can just wait for the same phase to come up. You measure the period and that tells you what the luminosity of the star is. And, and you can see why that is, because once the star is, this, these, these stars have gone out of equilibrium, they're oscillating. And the more massive the star is, the more time it takes for it to oscillate. And so, um, and, and so uh, uh, it's uh, long, the, the, the more massive the star, the, uh, the period will be uh, dependent on the mass of the star. And so uh, once you find these things and, you know, later on in various kinds of um, um, uh, uh, the research done in the last hundred years since Leavitt's discovery, um, we found that actually uh, there are two different kinds of Cepheids, um, type ones and type twos, which have slightly different period luminosity relations. And you can tell which type uh, of Cepheid it is by looking at its spectrum. Again, you can measure that which is uh, independent of its distance. You just take a spectrum of the star and that tells you uh, and, uh, what kind of Cepheid it is. Uh, 
it it because it's because it's in a different part, uh, slightly different part of that uh, of that husband wrestle diagram, and its composition is slightly different, the type ones and type twos, and so. Um, uh, so once you know that, you know the period luminosity relation, you know the luminosity. So that becomes a, um, uh, a standard candle. And this is one of the reasons the Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990. One of the key projects, actually the key project of the Hubble Space Telescope, it's named after Hubble, partly because um, um, it, it was out, set out to measure the, the scale of the universe, a, a job that Edwin Hubble had started. and Edwin Hubble was one of the first people who had used Cepheid variables to measure distances to stars outside our galaxy. So till now, we had looked at um, uh, parallaxes and spectroscopic parallaxes, which are measuring stars, uh, the distance to stars within our galaxy. You can find Cepheid variables, as I said, out to about 25, 30 megaparsecs. And, uh, and so, so you can go out to other galaxies, the distances between galaxies are megaparsecs. The nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, um, is 0.7 megaparsecs away. So you can find Cepheid variables in it. Cepheid variables were found in the Andromeda galaxy in the 1930s. And so making that, um, uh, finding these Cepheid variables in external galaxies gives you a scale to measure uh, distances out to other galaxies, not just stars within our galaxy. So Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the cameras were designed to find these Cepheid variables in external stars out to the Virgo cluster, which is about, um, about 20 megaparsecs or so away, and then even beyond. And this is something that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in its uh, entire life that has been out there 30 years now uh, has, uh, has done quite a lot. And even in the first 10 years, it found uh, Cepheid variables out to about um, 30 uh, uh, megaparsecs. And in particular, um, it uh, made very, very accurate measurements to distances to a few galaxies, like 25 to 30 galaxies, in which each galaxy, they found many, many, many Cepheid variables. So that uh, um, you, um, uh, you may have several independent measures of the distance to the same galaxy. And as you know, if you measure something over and over, over and over again independently, you bring down the errors. And, uh, and so there are some very accurate measurements uh, down to uh, a few percent, um, a two to five percent um, errors um, of, um, uh, of distances to some nearby galaxies. So this was one of the dedicated projects of the Hubble Space Telescope. They had no competition. And in the early years, um, a, a lot of time was given to these projects and, and it did that wonderfully. So it's one of the biggest successes of the Hubble Space Telescope. And that told us um, how to measure distances out to, out to, uh, to megaparsecs and give us a, an idea of the distance scale in the, in the really nearby universe. And this is one of the examples of, uh, of uh, this is M100, one of the nearby spiral galaxies. And, uh, and uh, you, know, you have um, um, Cepheid variables that were found in them. So um, what, one, of the, one of the major discoveries that came out of using Cepheid variables, and we'll talk about this a little later um, uh, in, in some detail, is that it was found in the 1930s by Edwin Hubble that the, the universe is expanding. And the universe is expanding. It was found that, uh, and, and Cepheid variables were found in these galaxies. And it was also found that by me measuring the spectra, you can find that all the galaxies are going away from each other and the farther away the galaxy is and uh, measuring the distance through Cepheids, uh, uh, the more its velocity. And this is a signature of the expanding universe. So then um, there was between Hubble's uh, discovery of uh, uh, Cepheid variables in external galaxies and measuring uh, distances through it in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s, out to the 1990s, there wasn't much of a, uh, a big uh, jump in technology in, uh, in improving the standard candle, um, uh, standard candles, the standard candle features of, of, uh, of galaxies. And so what happened was people had other ways of measuring um, uh, distances, which are called second.
secondary distances, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But uh, the, the next big standard candle, the primary standard candle that was, uh, that was uh, found, which became a big tool um, in, in our uh, measuring distances of galaxies, were type 1a supernovae. And that was essentially established in the middle 90s, 94, 95. And in the second half of uh, today's talk, I'm going to talk about essentially that, um, how supernovae helped us measure the universe. So um, I'm just going to um, come back to this in a minute. But I'm just saying that, that in between the 1930s and the 1990s, um, it, it seemed that if you go further and further away, um, you couldn't, you had to build on these primary distance indicators and you couldn't do much more. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so, the distances that we were measuring to faraway galaxies uh, were uh, had errors of the level of 25%, 30%, because we didn't have these primary distances. So for example, uh, I'll, I'll come back to these in a minute. So um, then what we did was we started measuring distances using what we, known, uh, what we call secondary distance indicators, which means that you have a bunch of galaxies for which you have primary distances, measured by, um, say, Cepheid variables. And now, of course, we have supernovae. But at that time, only secondary, uh, in, in, we had Cepheid variables and our Lyries and variable stars. And, uh, but then these single stars are not really visible in very far away galaxies. You, you can't resolve them to find these variable stars beyond a certain point. Even when you go to space and you have exquisite resolution, uh, your, um, I, I, this is one of the reasons why I talked about resolution for such a long time, even in space, your instrument limits your resolution. So you have to depend on some global properties um, uh, um, to find the luminosity, the primary luminosity of a galaxy. And so one used things like, for example, and this is a um, uh, um, uh, something called the Tully-Fisher relation, which, which means that what you do is what you can, is that you can measure the rotational speed of a galaxy uh, by certain means, by looking at their Doppler shift of, of one end of the galaxy and the other end of the galaxy and taking the difference between the two and finding something I did as a PhD student quite a lot uh, of measuring the rotational speeds of galaxies. Now, the more massive a galaxy is, the, um, the more its uh, speed of rotation. Uh, in, there's a relation between, a power law relation between the, the maximum velocity difference between the two ends of a galaxy and that gives you the rotational speed. The left-hand side of that relation uh, is related to the rotational speed of a spiral galaxy, and the right-hand side is uh, is a power of the luminosity of the galaxy. And it, that, that alpha, which is the power, depends on what band you're measuring it in. If you are measuring it in, uh, in, in uh, blue and in the red, it, it's a number that goes between two and four. Uh, and, and so you can see that if you uh, if you plot on the y-axis here is a, a, a log, a function of the log of the luminosity, and uh, on the x-axis here, this is the log of the of the rotational velocity. Uh, that W is the is the width of the, the spectral line, which is related to the rotational speed of the galaxy. Then you find a, a, this is a power law a relation, which has a huge scatter. So this I, I, I put this plot up just to show you. That um, that these are uh, this is a huge scatter on on these relations. Uh, but it, what happens is that you can measure the rotational speed of a galaxy by by looking at the spectrum of the galaxy from the Earth, and uh, that is independent of distance. And once you do that, then you can read off its luminosity from here, and that gives you the standard candle, right? But uh, this particular scatter introduces about twenty five percent error in or thirty percent error in your measurement uh, of in your prediction of the standard candle you can see how big that is and so you can only say that your the luminosity of the galaxy lies in this range if you have measured its uh, its uh, rotational velocity to be here then you can't exactly uh, pinpoint its luminosity and so then based on that if you measure the distance the distance will have that error so this was the state of the art in the 1970s 80s and early 90s when we wanted to measure distances to galaxies farther and farther and farther away, but we were thwarted by this, uh, this uh, scatter in the, in the secondary distance indicators. 
But there were several other secondary distance indicators other than the Stalin Fisher relation. You can take a cluster and you take its brightest galaxy. Some people said, well, if you take the brightest galaxy, that will, uh, that will be a standard candle. Uh, of course, there's a spread in that and things like that. So let's, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to go through these and let's, let's go to um, um, really a good measure of distances that changed this whole subject forever. And that happened in the 19, as, as I said, early 1990s, when people realized that if you can find a type 1a supernova, then that gives you the best standard candle that there is. So I'll spend some the, the rest of the of today uh, on this particular uh, topic because it gives it gave us a very startling uh, discovery about the nature of the universe, something that no other distance indicator could have given us. And that is because if you measure distances to far away galaxies, uh, then you have some measure of um, the, the history of the universe. As I said, you go farther and farther away in the past. If you're going very far away, to measuring um, uh, the distances to very uh, far away galaxies and their velocities, you can have a handle, have a handle on, on the expansion the rate of the, the universe as it was in the past. And, uh, and, and that uh, uh, was not possible if you really had uh, distance indicators that um, um, were, uh, had errors of 20, 25%. Uh, as soon as you got outside the local neighborhood, these distance errors meant that you could not really measure the expansion rate of the universe anymore um, to any level of accuracy. You really needed a much, much uh, better, better uh, distance indicator. Now, what a supernova. You heard about stellar evolution, and you're going to hear a lot about stellar evolution in this particular course. Uh, to know about supernova in great detail, you have to wait for a few more lectures uh, in the stellar evolution course. But what happens in the end of a, of a, of a star's evolution, as you saw out of, out of the main sequence, it goes through all these variable phases. And in the end, um, the star either decides to collapse into a compact star, and we have many lectures on compact objects in this course, white dwarfs, neutron stars, etc. Our, our sun, for example, is going to collapse uh, into a white dwarf. But if it's massive enough, what happens is that it can, uh, it, it can um, explode into what is known as a supernova. And you can see these supernovae. The supernovae actually emit um, light in a single supernova explosion, almost as much as, uh, as a whole galaxy, almost. And so in, in, in a very short period of time, and uh, you can see them very far away. In very far away galaxies, you can see supernovae. Now, supernovae can also happen in some other way. Like for example, in this particular scenario I'm talking about where there are, um, uh, there are uh, binary stars and an already evolved white dwarf, a compact star, can accrete matter from its binary companion. And if this, if this uh, accretion of matter onto that compact star happens very suddenly within a, a short period of time, it can lead into a catastrophic uh, um, situation in which uh, the loss of equilibrium is so much that the entire system explodes. So when a star evolves into a supernova, often what happens is that the, um, the core of that star implodes and the outer shell explodes. And there is no handle on uh, what fraction of that star will explode. But in this particular case, the whole star explodes. And if the whole star explodes, you can see that the amount of energy that's released from this star, which is a significant fraction of its rest energy, e equals mc squared, is going to be related to the mass of the star, right? And, and so this gives us a very nice way of physically establishing how much energy is released in this particular explosion. Remember the luminosity, which, is the, uh, which gives you uh, the, the main feature of the standard candle is that a way of predicting how luminous the star is. So this is what happened. And this led to uh, the Nobel Prize of, uh, um, of, of, uh, of 2011, um, uh, which, uh, um, because they established the standard candle nature of supernovae, it led to the discovery of dark energy. Uh, and I'm going to say uh, how. Uh, 
And then of course you have your entire wonderful lectures on dark energy later on by Varun Sahani, do not miss them. But um, what we now know is that the universe is expanding. What happened is it started from Big Bang and it's expanding and expanding in a, in a very interesting way. And if you want to understand how the universe is expanding, you should not look at textbook pictures like the one above where you often people say, you know, we are galaxies, which are the basic building blocks of the universe. They are lying in space and space itself is expanding, but the illustration given in standard textbooks is this, which means that galaxies are, are little bits of spots on a balloon. And as the balloon expands, the, uh, the space between these galaxies expand. That is right, but not in this kind of a picture because then you can ask the question, who's blowing into that balloon? It's not a really good uh, representation. A good representation is the one below. And, and that is, for example, if you have a three-dimensional object, like say uh, you, you make some dough, you put some yeast in it, and you put some raisins in it, and you stick it in some heating object, an oven, a tandoor, or whatever, and then it slowly becomes bread or cake or whatever. It expands, and, and the whole thing expands, and you can see that little object. Themselves, they don't expand, the little raisins or whatever, but they, uh, they go away from each other. And this is what's happening to the universe. The space-time itself, is expanding and the galaxies are moving with it. Now, the difference between this picture and the real, um, real world is that the galaxies are free to move. And this is why we had this discussion earlier on in these lectures. And that is because the galaxies themselves can attract each other as they move with the uh, universe, it can be slowed down or even turned around by um, nearby galaxies pulling each other through gravitation. Okay, so that's, that's how the universe is expanding. And this was discovered by this gentleman called Edwin Hubble in the 19, um, uh, in the 19, uh, in the 20s, uh, early 20s, early 30s. And what he did was he found that the further away a galaxy is, the, um, the, the, the more it's uh, radial velocity away from us, right? Uh, his particular, his first plot that he, he, he published in 1930 was not very impressive. Uh, if you look at these uh, velocities and these are distances, it's quite a scatter. And he had the uh, courage to draw a, a straight line through it. Um, uh, if uh, one of my students brings me this plot with a straight line through it, I won't believe them. Um, but it, it turns out, if you look at current measurements, it has ac absolutely accurate um, uh, prediction. Uh, his, uh, his distances were had very large errors in them, made with Cepheid variables. and. Uh, in this plot, so he, he wrote this, this particular uh, relation down, uh, V, which is the radial velocity that you measure through um, the Doppler shifts in, um, in, in spectral lines, and the distance that is measured um, through the Cepheid variables that I just talked about, uh, they are proportional to each other, and that H0, that is the Hubble constant, uh, which we call the Hubble constant, gives you the rate of expansion of the universe. Think about that. And, and so, um, so, um, and this is, this is what, uh, uh, this is how he measured his, uh, his, his uh, uh, redshifts. The redshifts were measured by looking at the, um, the spectra and uh, each uh, spectrum of a galaxy has these lines in them. They can be absorption lines, they can be emission lines. And uh, as a galaxy moves away from us, these things are shifted towards the red. Some galaxies are actually blue shifted because they're coming towards us. I talked about the Andromeda galaxy, for example, which is coming towards us. And, and, and here, for example, you can see Hubble's original plot in which there are all these galaxies that have negative velocities and Andromeda is one of them. And there are some others in the local group that are coming towards us. And that is because the gravity has overcome the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the expansion of the universe in there. But here is a big scatter. But uh, what happened was, of course, uh, his measurements were wrong, uh, had large errors, not wrong, but had large errors. And if you look at the same Hubble plot, for example, uh, in, um, in, in, in terms of much later, much more accurate uh, measurements, you can find that if you, if you go from his plot, which is this entire range, um, in this particular plot, in that little yellow, uh, uh, little yellow uh, um, spot, they all fit in there. As you go to further and further distances, and we learned how to measure these distances much more accurately, uh, uh, through all these distance indicators I talked about, we found that actually this is a pretty linear relation, right? Uh, 
Now the question comes, you're talking of a linear relation between velocity and distance. And the slope of that line gives you the expansion of the universe, right? And this is in the local neighborhood. You're talking of, if I'm looking at million light years or, uh, or uh, megaparsecs on the, on the um, uh, uh, x-axis, we are looking at maybe a thousand million light years, which is, you know, not, which is our neighborhood in, um, in, uh, in galaxies, which means that we're looking at the current expansion rate of the universe. But what was the expansion rate of the universe in the past? Now, if you think about it, if the, when the universe started in a big bang and it had a, has an initial impulse that made it uh, expand, now the universe is full of matter, but well, that's what we thought. And if you look at uh, classic uh, books like uh, Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, you, um, you read about this, you read about what we expect the universe to do. Of course, Brief History of Time was written before the discovery of supernovae and, and the discovery of dark energy. And so um, um, even Stephen Hawking at that time and everybody else, and when we were students, we thought that because the universe is made up of matter, what will happen is that as the universe starts off with a, with a big bang, it's going to slowly slow down. It's like some, you throw up something in the air and gravity pulls it down because matter is, uh, gives you the force of gravitation, it pulls you back and it decelerates, it will decelerate. And, and then come either, if, you, if, if the force is, is strong enough, it will go up to a, a, a particular distance and it'll come back again, right? If it's not, even if you have escape velocity, it means that it's going to slow down and then escape, but it, it's going to slow down. So we expected the universe to, after the Big Bang, to slow down in its expansion. And so what happens is that if you look further and further away from us, because you're looking at the past history of the universe, you expect this particular plot to curve, curve in a direction such that the expansion rate of the universe is, was expected to be uh, much faster in the, uh, in, in, in the past. And so further away, this curve, the slope of this curve would increase and it would go this way, right? It is going to uh, increase uh, in the past as you look further and further away. Now in this particular plot, and this is a plot of the Hubble um, law, from the early 90s, before supernovae were used, we did not know, um, um, we did not see any curvature. And that is because, as you can see, there wasn't any good measurement of the distance beyond our only nearby galaxies. And one or two points here can't tell you whether it's going this way or going that way. This changed with the discovery of supernovae as standard candles. We, um, we knew at that time, for example, that the universe uh, was essentially made up of matter. That's how we were taught when we were students. And uh, we know, knew at that time that uh, much of the universe, uh, the matter is dark. We don't see it because it doesn't emit light. Uh, this is something that will be talked about a lot in later, in later lectures. I'm only giving the introduction to the, the subject. And, uh, and, and so in the early 90s, even the early 1990s, I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, and this is just showing how new this subject is. We absolutely believe that the universe is made of matter. We were worried about what this matter was, this dark matter, etc. And we were told that uh, we'll have to figure out how much matter there is to figure out whether the universe slows down and comes back again. Um, Stephen Hawking writes in his book in, a, in great detail about this, or it slows down and keeps on slowing down up to infinity. So these are open and closed universes. All this was, was things that we were worrying about till supernovae was discovered. And supernovae actually, these uh, supernovae can be very, very bright. Here is uh, an example of a type 1a supernova that happened very nearby in our closest galaxy. Remember, I showed you the picture of the Magellanic Cloud, which is not far away from us. Uh, it's one of our satellite galaxies. And this happened in 1987. And uh, that star blew up into that star. And it stayed like that for a few months. And so 
you can see how bright they are and this is why you can see them very far away and they are standard candles and what happens is and and what uh, these people who got the nobel prize for this uh, when they established that this is a, a supernova is a is a standard candle the type 1a supernova and you can actually establish whether this type 1a supernova in which the whole star explodes by looking at its spectrum uh, its spectrum tells you whether it's a type 1a supernova type 2 which is the type in which um, part of the star explodes and that's not a standard candle because then there's a, there's a problem between how much of the star explodes and how much doesn't is that you can see that there are all these uh, various uh, kinds of uh, uh, light curves and so it takes about a month or so for a supernova to reach its peak and then uh, and then um, taper down and then finally vanish and what what these people uh, Perlmutter and Schmidt and others uh, found was that the peak of this supernova uh, is a standard candle and uh, it, it depends on the type of it uh, and, and you can actually relate it to the measure of um, the uh, another parameter and that is the width of this curve so the width of this curve is related to its peak you can see that if the width is not that much the peak is much lower etc so you can measure the width by looking at its full light curve and then you can predict what uh, its luminosity is going to be, the peak luminosity. The peak luminosity is the standard candle. And if you can catch it before it reaches its peak and you can map its entire uh, shape of its, uh, of its uh, uh, light curve, you can figure out how far um, away it is because it is a standard candle. That's the whole point. And so once that started, then uh, you know, from the middle 90s, people started um, dedicated supernova um, surveys to find these type 1a supernovae. I found a type 1a supernovae in my very first observing run in 1991 when I went uh, as, a, um, uh, as, a, as a young observer to a telescope in Chile. In those days, uh, uh, type 1a supernovae uh, were not that famous because uh, people hadn't discovered that they were standard candles. Uh, and in those days, you were discovering um, 30, 40 supernovae in a whole year. Once they were found to be standard candles and these dedicated surveys started of telescopes all over the world and started dedicated uh, 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 campaigns to look for these supernovae, people were finding uh, more than a thousand supernovae every year and many of them, uh, hundreds of them turned out to be supernova, type 1a supernova. This is now, for example, the Blanco 4 meter telescope in Cerro Tololo in Chile, with which I discovered my supernova in 1991, is now a dedicated supernova hunting machine. It is called the Dark Energy Telescope. And, uh, and uh, it, it is dedicated to uh, looking at various parts of the sky uh, right from the mid 90s. And now even more so, it has, uh, um, it has cameras that um, essentially take pictures of the same parts of the sky, about 500 of them, different parts of the sky uh, every year, every, every night, and then comes back to it and comes back to it and comes back to it every night. And so once such things uh, um, are done and these, these hundreds of fields are compared digitally and uh, suddenly you would find a supernova appear on one of these galaxies. And once that is done, bigger uh, telescopes are, are, uh, are uh, informed, including the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes in space, and they would look at, at them more in more detail. And so here is what happened. So here's Hubble's plot in, in 1995, I told you, and the 1929 data of Hubble fits in there. And we didn't know what's gonna happen later on. And then after the first 100 supernovae, uh, uh, type 1a supernovae, which are calibrated and known as standard candles was found, things changed very rapidly, which led to the Nobel Prize. And, and what happened was that, uh, you know, one could measure the distances. And we found um, that, um, that um, the, um, as you can see, the, the 1995 data fit, uh, fits right in there, that the, the, um, the curve of the um, Hubble plot um, uh, went in the, in the direction we were not expecting it to. We wanted the, uh, in the past to, for the, the, the slope of that line to steepen because the, the universe was uh, expanding uh, much faster if, if we are in a matter-dominated universe in the past. But it turns out 
the universe was actually expanding much slower in the past. As you can see, uh, you're going, looking at further and further away and you're looking at uh, the, the uh, slope of the curve much less than, than the slope it is, is now. And so this led to the, the great discovery that, um, that the universe is actually accelerating. The universe, the rate of expansion of the universe is actually um, is speeding up. And this cannot happen in a matter dominated universe because matter gravitates, matter pulls back the, um, uh, the universe in its expansion. And so, um, so this led to people now believing that the universe is, is accelerating and thus the universe is not made up of just matter, but it is made up of a, of a different kind of uh, component and that is known as dark energy. And, uh, and, and, and this now has been corroborated of course by Planck, which is a cosmic microwave background uh, um, uh, instrument, which you will hear about. You'll hear about a lot of these observational cosmology experiments later on in this course. And you will hear how we have now got evidence of the existence of dark energy from various sources, not just supernovae. Uh, but the supernovae helped us first understand. And you can see how uh, the fact that the universe is made up uh, almost three quarters of the energy content of the universe is actually dark energy, which, um, not, which does not gravitate, which does not pull, but it pushes. And it pushes, and that is why the universe is accelerating. Don't ask me um, what the dark energy is. We haven't yet figured it out. That is up to you to find out. That is the problem of the coming generation, to figure out what this dark energy is. And this is a very young subject. We are learning. The reason I... I'm choosing to end here is the following. I started with a very boring topic, boring topic of finding out how far away things are, right? And I said I had to measure the uh, size of the earth and measure the distance to the moon and bouncing off uh, lasers and things like that. And then we tried to figure out, and of course, moon we can go to, some, people, some of us have gone to the moon, but then rapidly we get into a territory where we can't go. And so we look at things that we can do, use our brain and try to figure out parallax and stuff like that to measure the distances to the nearest stars. And then we go out of our galaxy and try to measure the distance of the nearby galaxies by looking at, uh, by finding variable stars in them or looking at their rotation and trying to figure out whether that can be used as a standard candle. And then we're clutching at straws. We are desperately finding, trying to find a standard candle that will help us measure the distance and then just by trying to measure distances to galaxies, to these units in this expansion of the universe further and further away, we start making startling discoveries about physics itself, about the universe itself, about the age of the universe, about the expansion of the universe, about the history of the universe. And we can make predictions about what is going to happen to the universe in the future. And so small questions like these uh, boring questions like these lead to the most profound uh, questions and, and profound answers. It's a good example of it. I hope um, these, uh, these lectures have, um, have introduced you to the subject in general. Uh, and uh, uh, don't ask me questions about uh, things outside uh, what I'm talking about, because the rest of this course, there are 60 odd lectures to come in this course. Uh, they will address a lot of the issues that, uh, that we started off uh, by mentioning in this introduction. Of course. I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Shomak. Um, so I've been looking at the chats and uh, there are quite a few people who have asked similar questions. So maybe I will just ask on behalf of them. Yeah, um, okay. So one of the question uh, that is very commonly asked is why do Cepheid variables oscillate um, and what is the physical mechanism behind this? Okay, so uh, this uh, will come. Uh, uh, I, the, the physics of variable stars, the physics of stars uh, will be dealt with in the stellar evolution course uh, in the stars course later on, but let me give you a, a very um, a brief answer. <clears throat> what happens is that when a star, uh, and this uh, Dr. Sri Anand talked about in yesterday's uh, lecture on, 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 on stellar physics, um, when a star is actually burning nuclear fuel in the middle, uh, 
uh, like our sun is, for example, it is it has a certain kind of equilibrium, and the equilibrium is between the energy it generates uh, as a result of this nuclear fusion and the um, thermal uh, motion of the particles that make up the star. That thermal motion of the particles um, give it a certain pressure, the thermal pressure, which uh, um, which actually um, uh, uh, is there because of the heat that is generated in the middle. And then there's the gravity of the star itself that, collapse, that, uh, that is trying to collapse the star. So the collapse of the star is, uh, is counteracted by various things. And one of them is, is the radiation uh, uh, pressure. Another is the thermal motion of the, of the particles due to all this heat that's generated in the star. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and, this, the, and, and there's a, a equilibrium throughout the life of the star in which the fusion happens. Once the fusion stops, because the fuel has been all used up and our, this will happen to our sun as well in about four billion years or so. Then what happens is that you, you've lost this equilibrium. And once you lose this equilibrium, then uh, you are on your way of, of collapsing under gravity or you have these instabilities that come because it's a very massive object. It, this is not going to happen immediately. Uh, so there is quite a lot of uh, energy, kinetic energy of the particles still there in the sun, uh, in, the, in the star, as well as there's gravity. And so there, there will be a, a tussle between the two. <clears throat> and this leads to various kinds of instabilities in the, in the body of the star. And one of them is the kind of instability in which uh, the star, the entire star starts to um, oscillate. It becomes large, it becomes small, it becomes large, and it becomes small. And, and after a lot of oscillation, it also, it's also losing some matter, etc. It comes to some kind of a, a, an end, and that end could be the whole thing. A, a lot of matter, uh, outer layers of the star dispersing out and the middle collapsing, or it can blow, it can blow up. Now in this oscillating phase, you can see, look at, think about the star as a black body. As it oscillates, it becomes much larger, its area increases. Now, if you remember Stefan's law, you know that Stefan's law is the luminosity of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of a black body, which is the star, is, is, is a function of its area times t to the power four, the temperature to the power four times uh, a constant, the Stefan is constant. So as the area increases, the temperature is, 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 is the same. So the, the uh, luminosity, the, the, the amount of uh, energy coming out uh, at, at the surface brightness of the star has to change, right? So uh, as the area changes because the, the radius of the star is changing. And so as the star oscillates and becomes large and small, its, uh, um, its brightness changes, right? And this is why you have the brightness as a function of time, right? So uh, you can have other ways of changing uh, in, in variable stars. There are many kinds of variable stars. And uh, you know, this is a whole subject on its own, but Cepheid variables are stars that are oscillating as a whole. It can be stars that are rotating. And for example, pulsars are stars that are rotating and, 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 and their brightness changes. Anyway, okay, so. Yeah, uh, thanks. I think that answers a lot of the questions that uh, people had been raising. Uh, then there's another question which is uh, how do we measure the luminosity of standard candles exactly? This is from Shweta NK. Yeah, I think uh, this question was asked yesterday as well. Uh, I think uh, um, you cannot. How can you measure the luminosity of a standard candle? You can measure the luminosity. Luminosity is the absolute luminosity. The luminosity, uh, unless you're talking about the measuring the flux, the, the, the two different things. There is the absolute luminosity, which means the amount of power that comes out of the object, watts in watts, in, you know, um, in energy per unit time, okay? That's what I call the absolute luminosity. And then there is another thing which is called the apparent luminosity, which means it is a measure of the amount of energy that I'm receiving on my detector or telescope per unit time. These are two different things. So I'll talk about both. The actual luminosity of the star you cannot measure because you can't go there. I can measure the luminosity of this bulb by, uh, you know, uh, by, by making measurements because I can, I have it. I don't have that star. So in this equation where uh, I, I write down uh, luminosity equals 
the, the flux that I'm, I'm getting equals luminosity divided by four pi r squared, uh, that L, the, the, the actual absolute mass I cannot measure, but I can only infer it from some other physics. And this is the whole point of these lectures. We were saying that, for example, from the husband russell diagram, from its temperature, I can measure the luminosity. I, um, there, are, there are places where I can, uh, from the, the time period of the variable star of the Cepheid variable, I can measure its luminosity. So the luminosity I can't measure, but I can infer. And then from that luminosity, I can measure the distance. If I can measure the apparent magnitude or apparent luminosity, and that is the flux of the radiation that I get at my detector. And that is measured by taking a telescope, focusing the light that you're getting from it, that light could be optical light, could be infrared light, could be radio light or whatever, and then focusing it on a detector. And that detector has some way of measuring it. Of course, that is a whole subject of its own and you will hear about some, some part of it. In fact, today's afternoon lecture is by Ranjan Gupta talking about photometry. Photometry is the art of measuring light. And so that's, there you will learn how, how people measure uh, the flux that is coming at the telescope, the apparent luminosity. Once you do photometry, that gives you the flux that comes at, at, at my telescope. And then the ratio between the actual luminosity and this, uh, this apparent luminosity gives me the distance squared. Yes, next. Um, so I was also thinking if there are, um if the supernova has gone off or the standard candle is in a place where you can geometrically measure the distance, then perhaps you can also get the luminosity from there, right? Yes, of course. So uh, actually you have to calibrate these things, right? So uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, actually if you have a parallax, for example, that's, that's why you build, you build up these things, right? So you build up these things. So the Cepheid variables, the nearby, the nearest Cepheid variables have had parallax measures done. So the geometric way of doing it uh, then establishes the distance of that Cepheid variables and that you calibrate the Cepheid variable distances. Now, the galaxies where you have the supernovae, there is no geometric, direct geometric way of measuring its luminosity because uh, you can't measure parallaxes of, of galaxies, but, uh, uh, but, but you can have Cepheid variables in these galaxies, which uh, have, uh, in other Cepheid variables, you have measured parallaxes variables in our own galaxy. And so by bootstrapping, by doing this ladder, you can measure um, distances out there, yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Shomak, there are uh, other people who are also asking about whether the lecture slides can be made available. And, yes, it can uh, be, certainly. Okay. Um, and if there are reference uh, books which uh, you can quote, then that would be great as well. So. Okay. Um, maybe in the slides, uh, one of the last slides you can put in the reference. When I, when I put them up, the slides up, I'll put some references in there. That might yeah. be a good way of doing it. That would be great. Uh, do you mind going to the YouTube questions as well? Yes, I'm looking at them now. Uh, if I can uh, stop sharing and I'm going to um, the, the questions from YouTube. I have uh, here, um, right, so I have Ishita Chatterjee talking about um, uh, why is it called spectroscopic parallax? Uh, and that's actually a, a not a very good term, but it's historically used. Uh, it is not a parallax measurement, right? Uh, geomet parallax is a geometric measurement in which we look at the motion of the um, of the star um, as it as you see it, and then uh, uh, the uh, and then you, it's a geometric direct measurement. But uh, here it's an indirect way of measuring the distance. And uh, historically, what happened was people um, would measure the spectrum of the star, get the temperature, and from the HR diagram, then get the luminosity and use it as a standard candle to find the distance. So it gives you the same result as the parallax measurement, but it's done through a spectrum. So people used to call it spectroscopic parallax. Looking back at such things 100 years later, sometimes these things uh, seem a little stupid, but there you are. That's how, uh, that's how people do it. So it's, it's not really, should be, it should not be taken literally. Um, now, there's another question up there, um, which is interesting in the YouTube, uh, among the YouTube viewers, and that is uh, from Sourad Bharti, who talks about, 
how do we detect the type of the supernovae? Now, it's a very interesting question, and uh, I think you'll get the answer, more of these answers later on when people talk about supernovae. As you know, uh, different stars, <clears throat> according to the mass of the star, different stars have um, a different composition. So if very low mass stars make only hydrogen into helium in their cores, and then the helium uh, can be fused to make uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera. And you, know, you will learn about this in the stellar evolution course. And, and so, but if you are a very massive star, much higher elements, in fact, all the elements that are in the periodic table are made inside stars, as you know. I mean, the universe only gave us hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium, that's it. That's, that came from the Big Bang, but um, everything else is made inside a star. And so um, more, the more massive stars make uh, um, higher elements in more complicated nuclear fusion mechanisms, and they go all the way up to iron. <clears throat> now, these are the stars also, the more massive stars, that explode into type two supernovae in which where the outside explodes and the inside implodes to form a neutron star or a black hole. You'll hear a lot about it if you stay with us through the month. Now in the spectrum of the supernova, of the supernova remnant, then you will find uh, very high um, uh, uh, in, the, in the periodic table elements like neon, like iron, like uh, uh, you know, copper and things like that. And you have spectral lines of them. And once you have that, that you, you know that these are very massive stars and these are typical of supernovae, whereas uh, of, of type two supernovae. Type one A supernovae are white dwarfs, carbon white dwarfs, carbon oxygen white dwarfs that got uh, dumped a lot of matter on it and they exploded. These were very low mass stars that came from low mass stars. So there is no element higher than atomic number 10 or so. In the, uh, in, in, in the spectrum of these. So just looking for, uh, because we know the composition of type one uh, progenitors, type one, type two progenitors, we can figure out um, just looking at the composition of different elements that you will see in the spectrum, what kind of supernova it is, okay? Um, uh, Surud, do we have any other questions in the... Yeah, so uh, in the chat, uh, there, is, there is one question, I think, which again is quite common, which is if supernovae are like transient events, then how do we know where to look and when a particular thing will occur, right? So mm -hmm. basically, how do we find them? And uh, a related question is, um, how, how can we isolate the light coming from a supernova since it's going off in a galaxy? And uh, there are so many stars in the galaxy. Both excellent questions. I mean, I, um, I think I um, actually um, uh, had a couple of slides on this. Uh, if, we, if you remember, the, this kind of slide shows you um, <clears throat> the kind of campaigns that happen. So I actually didn't go to um, great detail about how these programs are done. But they're dead. So I, I'll, I'll address the first question first, and then uh, looking at how how people super, how supernovae are found. So what what happens is that because, as I showed you other pictures, also when a supernova appears in a galaxy, it outshines almost the galaxy. You can see it as a big uh, as a um, as a big blob on on the image of the galaxy. And uh, but other on other nights when a supernova hasn't happened had uh, happened on a galaxy they appear the same. So if you, if for example, you have a telescope that is that takes pictures of hundreds of fields every night and then compares uh, last night's image to this night's image, then you can find whether anything has changed in these galaxies. That's how I discovered my supernova. As I said, in my first observing run, I happened to measure, take an image of a galaxy uh, on one night and the next night, because there's something I, I was not satisfied with the image. I took, repeated uh, the, the and, and took another image. And lo and behold, I saw something that was not there uh, in, uh, in previous uh, images um, of, uh, of, of the same galaxy taken by others and things like that. And so if you do this systematically, then, um, then you can find out what has changed. Now, some of these changes will come from noise or it could come from a, you know, an asteroid or a, or a shooting star or something like that, a meteorite. But some, some of them will be there and will be there and will be brightening night after night after night. Now, it is impossible for people to look at these things by eye every night. And so these things are done digitally. So for example, 
uh, one particular telescope that is taking pictures of all these uh, hundreds of fields every night. The next night they will take the same same pictures of the same parts of the sky and they will be uh, superposed on each other and a difference will be taken. And then the difference will show uh, what has changed, right? And many of them will be supernova. It will be supernova if you see it in you know, three or four nights in a row and you see it brightening, then you realize that you're up on a supernova and then you start following up. And so there are other telescopes that are given these messages. We have a system of astronomical telegrams that go out everywhere. They used to be real telegrams, but now they are telegrams on the web and alerts go out and supernova alerts. So other telescopes start looking at these things, right? So that's, that's the first question. The second question is related and it's very interesting. And that is, as you can see, that uh, you have the supernova sitting on the, the rest of the galaxy. Uh, and of course, they, they will have a very different structure of, uh, of the distribution of light. So one of the you know, first things you learn as a PhD student working with optical images is how to model um, a galaxy uh, and, and, um, and, and then from the rest of the galaxy image, you can infer what this galaxy, this part would look like and you can subtract it off. So uh, because the supernova itself is a point object, because the star itself in such a faraway galaxy would have a size that is probably, you know, I don't know, 10 to the power minus five arc seconds or so, or, or even smaller. Actually, the, the size will be related to the point spread function of our atmosphere, the atmosphere blurring. And so it's a point object. It will have a profile that will be well known from other stars. And you can model that. And, uh, and you can model the rest of the galaxy from the rest of the galaxy. And you can then subtract it off. And this, is, this has to be done, of course, if you have to very accurately measure the luminosity of the supernova, right? Yeah, thanks a lot, Shomak. Um, that was quite useful and I hope all the participants found it useful as well. Um, so Thank you very much. Wrap up here? So, so today we wrap up and then um, 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 I hope you have a, a good fun with the rest of the, uh, rest of the course.